Welcome to aerodynamics. We are now in chapter three, working on the potential flow theory. Uh, so in previous lectures, we have broken the aerodynamic problem into a um, viscous problem that is completely independent from the potential flow problem. The viscous problem deals with, or the viscous flow theory, which we call the boundary layer theory, deals with the flow right next to the airfoil. And that allows us to predict the wall shear stress on the surface of the airfoil. And um, the potential flow theory that we are starting today will allow us to predict um, the pressure distribution over the surface of the airfoil. And these are the two necessary items uh, or, or distributions, the pressure distribution and shear stress distribution, uh, that we need to predict the lift and drag on a particular airfoil. Um, so what is this potential flow theory? Go so that uh, boundary layer theory we have covered earlier. So our focus is now going to shift <clears throat> to the potential flow theory. And what does that help us uh, do? So as we said earlier, we start with a an airfoil shape and our task is to predict the velocity, is to compute the velocity distribution around uh, the airfoil. And from that velocity distribution around the airfoil, we can use Bernoulli to predict the pressure distribution over the airfoil. So our task in this chapter is to um, predict the velocity field, but we're going to do it in sort of an indirect way. We will introduce um, the velocity potential function and the stream function that we have um, talked about before. So we will introduce them into the potential flow theory because they are surrogates or they are derived or you can derive the velocity field from them. Um, so if we work with them, it's going to be easier to, um, to, uh, um, to solve and then to derive from them the velocity distribution. So our aim in this chapter is, uh, so the, the one question that we're trying to answer is, you have an airfoil shape, uh, please predict the uh, velocity distribution over the airfoil so that you can predict the pressure. And how are we going to predict the velocity distribution over the airfoil? Is um, we will do that in an indirect way by looking at the velocity potential uh, function and the stream function. And uh, if you remember, the stream function is a, is a family of lines, of uh, uh, streamlines um, described by this particular function. And the streamlines describe the uh, flow direction um, and the flow pattern. And the velocity potential uh, isn't, so the relationship between, there is a, relationship between the stream function and the and the velocity field. So we can derive the stream function from the velocity field as we have seen in a previous example and vice versa. We can get the stream function from the velocity field. Same thing. The velocity potential function is defined for an irrotational flow. Um, so that's a property of the uh, potential. And it is um, de it is derived from um, the velocity field, and we can derive the velocity field from. Uh, so this will it will become obvious why we are trying to complicate things instead of working with the velocity field v. So here we have now three fields. We have the velocity field v, which is a vector field, but now we have those um, functions, uh, non-vectorial functions, the um, uh, potential flow, the potential uh, velocity potential function and the stream function uh, that we are going to use as surrogates for the velocity field. We're not going to work with the velocity field directly because it's going to complicate things. Um, it's easier to work with those two functions and from that uh, eventually once we find what these stream function and uh, potential function are, we can then uh, produce the velocity field uh, easily. Um, so what I will show you next is that these velocity potential and stream functions do, do not violate 
the basic principles that we have been talking about uh, so far. And the basic principles, um, in fact, we're going to only talk about two. Um, we're going to only consider two basic principles in this course. One is that, uh, or in this potential flow chapter, that the velocity that um, our flow um, is irrotational and that our uh, flow is mass conservative. So it's divergence free. Uh, divergence free. So <clears throat> uh, we have defined. So now let's 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 go over that. Let's consider a. Uh, let's start with the stream function and let's consider um, uh, one of the lines that uh, one of the streamlines where psi is equal to constant. And when you have psi equal constant, you take the derivative d psi is d constant will give you a zero. So d psi is zero. So let's plug d psi is zero. So d psi, I can use this chain rule to write it as d psi dx times delta x plus d psi dy times delta y. Uh, because it depends so the assumption we're making here is that we have a two-dimensional field and psi depends on x and y um, and that's equal to zero just because i'm starting with a constant um, with a psi equal constant line or a constant streamline okay so by definition from two lectures ago d psi dx is the negative of the vertical component of the velocity and d psi dy is the horizontal component of the velocity. And then you rearrange, um, v dx goes to the other side, so you get dx, dy dx, which is the slope um, of a one stream uh, function or one streamline, is equal to v over u, which is the definition of the streamline which we started uh, all along with in the beginning. Now let's consider um, Let's consider a um, constant velocity potential line. So phi is constant. So uh, when phi is constant, there is no variation on of phi along that line. So delta phi along that line is equal to zero. So same thing. Use the chain rule. Uh, d phi dx, d phi dy, and d phi dx gives you the u velocity, and d phi dy gives you the v velocity. And what you'll notice is that um, the slope of this line uh, for phi equal constant is minus u over v, while here it's v over u. So if you multiply those, two, or if you um, uh, divide those two together uh, by each other, you're going to get minus 1, which means those two lines are perpendicular. So you have one line that has um, a certain slope, let's say 5. This would have, this should, because it's perpendicular, the other line would have a slope of minus one fifth. Um, so when you multiply them by each other, you're going to get a minus uh, one. So we we have uh, we have come out, we have um, gotten to this result from uh, starting from the definition of a uh, constant streamline and a constant stream function. But this also tells us that the stream um, function and the velocity potential function, uh, when you draw them, they're actually going to be perpendicular to each other. So that's why they call it velocity potential. It's sort of a voltage, while the stream function is more like a current, if you're thinking about uh, electricity. Um, so here, here's an airfoil. Uh, these are your streamlines. And the difference between those uh, velocity, so these are streamlines aerofoil and the red lines are constant uh, phi or constant velocity potential lines uh, streamlines are constant psi so the difference between the uh, phi 1 and phi 2 here is what drives the um, is what drives the flow between them so you you want to consider this as sort of a velocity um, so forgive me a um, voltage difference that drives a current between um, between those two voltage voltages or potentials so you want to think of it um, in that way and what is our, what is our task again I'm going to repeat this our task uh, our task is to predict the velocity field around this airfoil so we start with the shape of the airfoil and my goal in the end is to get to any point inside my flow field and ask you what is the 
horizontal velocity u b and what is the vertical velocity v should be um, and you should be able to to answer that or that's what we aim to do is uh, we aim to find this velocity distribution at each and every point and especially on the surface of the aerofoil um, we are interested in finding the u and we are interested in finding the v because that will help us find the pressure field so again uh, if you jump in here and say well there is no slip condition remember we are outside the boundary layer so we actually have broken the problem into two problems one is a potential flow theory where viscosity is non-existent it's zero so i do not really have the no slip condition i my flow can slip as much as it likes um, and i have no boundary layer uh, because we've dealt with the boundary layer on its own so this is a this is this is definitely a huge simplification but um, the purpose of it is to actually just find the pressure distribution over the surface of the aerofoil so that's the 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 goal so my goal is to find the UNV or the in other words it's this V the velocity vector V at each and every point around my aerofoil um, and because that's a little bit more difficult to do, uh, we're just going to find either the psi or phi because they derive from each other. And once I find the psi, the family of streamlines or the family of velocity potentials, finding the velocity field is, um, is easy. And once I find the velocity field, I can get the pressure field uh, in no time through the Bernoulli equation. So that is our... Um, that is our game plan for uh, the coming few lectures on the potential flow theory. Okay. Um, so as we started by saying is th that we are going to follow two fundamental principles or basic principles. One is the mass conservation and we want our we want to guarantee that our velocity field, velocity potential field, and um, stream function field um, are mass conservative. Um, so here is so that they are divergence free. And the second basic principle is that they need to be outside the boundary layer, uh, which means we have our flow has no viscosity, our Reynolds number is infinity, so our flow is rotational which means it is curl free. So let's see what divergence free um, flow means. So delta V is zero, so that's our continuity equation. Um, and that's written in terms of the velocity field U and V, which we are familiar with, the continuity equation. But that's hard to work with. Um, it's just much easier to work with the velocity potential. So let's write the, uh, let's substitute for U and V with, um, their velocity potential equivalent so u is d phi dx so plug d phi dx over here and the d phi dy for v and you're going to end up with uh, del square phi by dx square and uh, del square phi by dy square yeah so that's a y uh, is equal to zero um, and that is the laplacian operator del square phi is zero so my mass conservation equation um, instead of writing it as the continuity equation i can just write say that the laplacian of the velocity potential is zero and by that i'm saying mass is conserved and my other condition is the um, curve free is that my flow is rotational so it's curve free so the curl of the vector of the velocity vector is zero which we have seen before or in other words the circulation the circulation which was the integral of the vorticity if you remember uh, omega da um, when we were talking about stokes theorem in a previous um in a previous slide in a previous lecture uh, so the circulation is zero because uh that's the circulate that's the the uh, um that's the vorticity, dv dx minus du dy. Um, so the curl free vector, when you do del cross v, you're going to get dv dx minus du dy is zero, and that thing is the vorticity in two dimensions. 
Uh, so when your vorticity is zero, is zero in two dimensions. Now, same thing. Instead, so here I'm, I'm sort of uh, guiding you into this. Uh, for the v, I want to use the stream function for the u and v uh, instead of the velocity potential. So for u, u and v, d psi dy and minus d psi dx. So plug them up there and you're going to end up with a similar equation, um, which is the Laplacian of the stream function. So now my um, mass conservation is written as the Laplacian of the velocity potential and my um, irrotationality is written as the Laplacian of the uh, stream function being both equal to zero. And now if you do the cross thing which is uh, now um, you plug in the divergence free uh, psi and same thing here in the curl free you plug in a phi instead of psi, you're going to get a similar result. You're going to get that um, that the um, phi, the velocity potential function, satisfies identically the um, the uh, curl of the the curl free uh, identity, uh, you know, uh, equation. So it's zero. So if you if you set that you're going to get um, that indeed del cross v using the velocity potential, you're going to get zero. So you're going to get del square phi dx dy minus del square phi dx dy. So that's identically equal to zero. So yes, not only does the velocity potential satisfy the continuity equation here, as we said, so that was continuity. Uh, but it also satisfies the uh, irrotationality condition. So, or the irrotationality uh, principle that we have started our potential flow theory uh, by uh, stipulating. And same thing uh, here. The, um, we've seen that the del square psi equals zero. So um, the Laplacian of the stream function um, satisfies the irrotationality. Uh, stipulation we so here our flow is rotational that we have started with the rotational um, you can you can use it you can use the psi with the stream function with the divergence free of the velocity of the uh, with the divergence free vector field velocity vector field or flow field and you're identically also going to get uh, to get it to satisfy it del square psi dx dy uh, minus del square psi dx dy is equal to zero. So indeed, uh, so here's here's those two slides in just uh, two sentences. The stream function satisfies mass conservation and satisfies the rotationality. And the velocity potential function satisfies mass conservation and satisfies the rotationality of the flow. So we can use them actually interchangeably, but sometimes uh, it's easier to work with one rather than the other, and sometimes it's easier to just actually mix and match. Uh, so here, here is our potential flow summary. Uh, our potential flow is mass conservative. So that's mass, cons it satisfies, you know, mass is conserved. That's what we're writing here, del square phi, psi equals, phi equals zero. And our potential flow is rotational, rotation free, is a rotational. Um, and if you if you look at those equations, this was del square phi by dx square, del square phi by dx square, plus del square phi by dy square. But you'll see you don't have a del square phi square, so or um, d phi dx, d phi dy. So these equations are actually linear partial differential equations. And that's that's one of the main, or actually this is a primary advantage of the um, potential flow theory. Uh, the potential flow theory uses those linear partial differential equations. So let's say, so far I'm, I'm, I just wrote two things. I wrote that mass is conserved and I wrote that the flow is rotational. I still haven't introduced what what the shape of my airfoil uh, is. But let's say one airfoil 
gives me one set of streamlines and then I get another airfoil that gives me another set of streamlines and now if I try and and so it gives me a set a set a um, stream function which is a family of streamlines so these are two different solutions and now if I sum those two different solutions the sum of them is also a solution because this is solution one this is solution two it satisfies the stream function equation the Laplacian um, then when I sum solution one and solution two I get solution three would also be a solution so I can from those two aerofoil shapes I can come up with a third aerofoil shape that is mass conservative and curl uh, free so in other words we always need to go back to the velocity field because we're after the pressure field so if I have a velocity field so instead of saying here I, I talked about it in terms of the streamline um, but I can just as well talk about it in terms of, of the velocity field so this airfoil has a certain velocity field distribution around it uh, v1 and this second airfoil we found it to have let's say we solve and we found it to have a different velocity distribution uh, around it u2 v2 uh, in two dimensions and both of them are solutions so both of them satisfy mass conservation and rotationality then um, my I can just blindly sum up v1 and v2 to be equal v3 as we've we've done here and that v3 which is the third airfoil will actually be a solution which means that it will be mass conservative and curl free so it would be a solution to the potential flow um, problem so we can interchangeably work with the velocity field or the stream function field or the potential um, velocity potential function field so these three derive so if i know one if i know one it's completely defined i can derive the other two from it very easily uh, but as, as I said before, sometimes this is not as straightforward as, as it is. I might know, <clears throat> excuse me, I might know the V and then something about the Psi and something about the Phi. So it helps me work out things um, in, that, uh, in a more easy way. Um, but if you wanted to just work with the velocity field, be my guest. It's going to make your, heart, your life uh, much more difficult it's much easier to work with the velocity potential or the stream function um, or the stream function uh, yeah family of, of lines but what are the again what are the basic principles that we are um, we are solving those equations for we're so we're saying that um, for me to predict the velocity so Here's what, what this says. It says that for me to be able to predict the velocity field, or uh, the, the pressure distribution around this airfoil, all, all I need to know is I need to satisfy mass conservation. And what does that mean? It means, okay, my, my, the, the airstream is going to come, it is going to hit the airfoil, and just because it's an airfoil, it's going to deflect around it. And that's what mass tells you mass is conserved. So mass has to go somewhere. It actually goes left and right. And mass conservation helps me predict. And it goes uh, in an irrotational way. So if I take a fluid element, remember this picture, um, it has this orientation around its axis. It will still have the same orient. It doesn't rotate about its axis. About its axis. So that's what we're saying when we're uh, by writing del square phi is zero and del square psi is equal to zero. We're saying I'm just trying to predict the shape of the streamlines based on the shape of the airfoil um, using those two assumptions is that uh, my flow must conserve mass otherwise it, it doesn't make much sense. This is the most basic so we, you can see we're we're trying to um, to satisfy just the very basic principles in, in life uh, uh, which is mass conservation you can't get any basic than that we're not even trying to do momentum or energy conservation um, 
in this exercise of the potential flow theory. We're only trying to say, okay, I'm not destroying mass. I'm not uh, making mass. I'm not uh, making it disappear. And the other thing is we're making this simplification that is associated with, with the... Um, with the absence of a boundary layer and the absence of a no-slip condition, which is the irrotationality, which tells me that my bending of the uh, flow streaks, straight lines or streamline is done uh, in an irrotational way such that the fluid particles maintain their orientation um, without rotating around their axis. That's that's the whole. These are the two basic assumptions, or the two basic premises of the potential flow theory. Um, so you can see, these are we're not even doing a momentum conservation. So um, if that raises your eyebrow, then it should. Um, but at least we're starting somewhere uh, to study aerodynamics. You're right. Uh, maybe this is not sufficient, but remember what we started with. We started this chapter by saying we're not going to get an you know an answer that will allow us to fly an airplane, but at least it would give us a trend and it would give us um, uh, maybe a an error of fifty percent, hundred percent. At least we we can get a ballpark number that rather than just trying to get to an uncertainty of 10%. We're not going to get a our answer to within 10%. That is not the um, not the purpose of of this um, potential flow theory, but it's very powerful because it helps us understand uh, understand flow fields, airfoils. In a very, in actually very simple, in a, um, using very simple math. So what we'll be doing next is actually we'll be doing quite a bit of of math, uh, and we're going to um, to exploit this linearity uh, property of these of these Laplacians, uh, and that is the uh, superposition principle. We can superpose um, multiple solutions. To get another another solution that we didn't have before. Okay, so I know it's so far it's still in the math realm. Uh, we're going to come to examples and then um, uh, talk about uh, um, a little bit more aerodynamics, more than math. But you want to keep the math because we need the math. Okay. Um, now here is here is the the important bit. Um, what, so that so here are some notes. Um, this Reynolds number is equal to infinity. Is just to say that uh, we have no slip, the no slip condition does not exist. We can slip uh, because we don't have vis viscosity that allow, that makes the fluid particles to stick to um, to the solid surface. Uh, so remember, Reynolds number was rho v times some length scale l divided by viscosity, and because viscosity is zero, because um, we are outside the boundary layer, uh, then my Reynolds number is infinity. So anytime you see a Reynolds number is infinity when you're reading a paper, it means that they're using the using this potential flow theory, and you will see that when you're uh, reading aerodynamic papers. And we will come to one of those, in fact, um, uh, later on. Now, here is the important, um, the important bit. Remember the definition of the streamline. So, if this is an airfoil, a streamline is a line that describes the direction of the flow. So, at any point, the velocity is tangent to the streamline. Which, by definition, a streamline, um, the velocity perpendicular to a streamline must be equal to what? Must be equal to zero, because by definition, the flow is parallel to the streamline. So, I I do not have any velocity component anywhere um, along the streamline perpendicular to the streamline. So that means between any two streamlines, 
uh, mass is conserved. So a streamline acts as a solid surface. So if this is my streamline S, it acts as a solid surface. And imagine now that I can create a streamline that looks like an aerofoil. Um, so that will represent a solid surface for me because mass cannot go through it, so it acts as a solid surface. So maybe this is not that clear at this moment, but we will uh, give more examples as we, uh, as we move forward. Um, but in, the other, in other words, on, we can write uh, that on the surface, because a streamline is a solid surface, an aerofoil is a solid surface, I can um, write that my aerofoil, by definition, um, has no mass perpendicular to it, so no mass per, uh, perpendicular to the aerofoil, because um, the v dot n is equal to zero, because that's because it's cosine 90, that gives me exactly equal to zero. So here's my velocity. And here's the north, that's the velocity vector v. So we're saying over the surface of the aerofoil, this is my velocity vector v. This is the velo this is the unit vector n that is perpendicular to the aerofoil. And just because it's a solid surface, I don't have any velocity component in the n direction. So that's equal to zero. And let's substitute for v with the velocity potential because we said it's always easier to work with it. Um, so I'm going to have uh, my my velocity potential lines um, along the normal to the aerofoil to be constant, which we sort of um, uh, seen before. So these are velo constant velocity potential lines. Now let's look at the stream function, and you'll see that the stream function is actually parallel um, to the surface of the aerofoil. So the surface of the aerofoil is a constant, the body, which we call Y body, the surface of the aerofoil um, is, a, is a constant stream function line. So this is the, this is an important equation or concept that we're going to work with throughout the semester. So remember, there's no slip on my, on my airfoil. So, um, uh, sorry, my airfoil is free to slip. Uh, forgive me. The, the flow on the airfoil is free to slip. So here's my velocity vector V. It has two components. Let me just change the color. Uh, it has a, a horizontal component and it has a vertical component that's my u and that's my v and if i have this is let's say this is x and y this y body this line x and y um so dx body dy body sorry this X and Y that describes the body of the aerofoil, uh, if I take the slope at any point, it's going to be the ratio of the velocities. Which is, this is another way of saying that, that the surface of the aerofoil is just a streamline because mass cannot go through it, cannot um, penetrate it. Um, this is going to... This is be going to become clearer when we give examples. So, what is the what is the um, the game plan here? What are let's just keep repeating this. What are we trying to do? Uh, one one way that uh, that the potential flow theory can be useful is let's say you start with the shape of the aerofoil. So that's given. So you're, you're, you've come up with this shape of the airfoil for some reason, or someone gave you this shape of the air, of airfoil, and they ask you, what is the pressure distribution over this body, over this airfoil? This is the question. This is the starting point. Um, then the answer to that will be is uh, we will start with those two 
assumptions I have this is X body Y body X and Y and uh, that's X and Y that's my coordinate system and at on on this colored line the airfoil it would be my X body Y body so let's just uh, be clear with the symbols so X body Y body describes the shape of the airfoil that's given and um, and um, we are asked to find this pressure distribution P body so that's the only thing that we have over here so what do we do well we start um, to find the pressure field we really need to find the velocity field uh, but to find the it's hard to work with the velocity field so we're going to work with the uh, velocity potential line so we're going to start with the velocity potential uh, function or the stream function uh, either one or both at the same time so we're going to write mass conservation and irrotationality del square phi and del square psi is equal to zero uh, so I have those two differential equations that describe uh, so if I start with this del square psi is equal to zero that would describe the shape of my streamlines but as a differential equation so I need to know what's I have it as a differential equations but what I'm after is to is the psi that I don't have yet I have I'm starting with del square psi so my task is to find the family of size uh, psi the the stream functions uh, so this is my goal is to eventually this would be the solution to this problem is to find this line let me just change the color um, is my the the solution of this equation will be psi and graphically we're actually going to be using graphical solution quite a bit this would be the solution so if I found that that means I solved my problem if I found what this shape of so I'm gonna get a function uh, X streamline as a function of Y streamline or Y streamline as a function of X streamline same story um, which describes that line that is that is what I'm after in the end um, and that one and you get you get you get the idea so now once i found that psi i can go um that's one way of doing it or i could just work with the velocity potential lines which is uh i need to find those perpendicular lines the family that describes those perpendicular lines to the surface of the airfoil that i started with as my input um so i'm gonna get so I solve this del square phi is zero and the solution will be phi. So now I found, let's say I found phi or I found psi. Um, same thing, from either one of those, I will be able to get the velocity by getting, by differentiating the, the, um, the psi was, was a, you know, the u and v were related to uh, d psi dy and minus d psi, um, minus this idx so um, just make sure you say you check the slide we had before so I had this I then I get the velocity field and once I get the velocity field and then I would apply Bernoulli where do I apply Bernoulli I have the region very far away from the aerofoil which we're going to call infinity so here and at infinity I know my uh, v infinity which is the relative velocity we've been talking about and the undisturbed pressure the undisturbed velocity and the undisturbed pressure uh, so these are the ones and because I found the velocity right I found the velocity around the airfoil but then I would have but let's continue with this then I can find uh, because this is a given I can find the pressure at any point um, in the flow field and if I take this streamline the stagnation streamline that actually hits the airfoil the airfoil shape will also be a streamline uh, which means um, and again the flow slips 
So, which means that I have the velocity here, V at the body, and I have P infinity and I have V infinity, so I can get the pressure of the body. So I can get the pressure distribution at any point on the body, uh, which is the whole uh, point or one important um, objective, at least for this course in the for the potential flow theory, is to find the pressure distribution around the uh, aerofoil, which will help me predict what the aerodynamic um, load or the aerodynamic force being generated by this aerofoil is going to be. So that is um, that is the 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 story or the reasoning behind what we're doing uh, over here. We're starting with very two basic principles, mass conservation and the rotationality. And we're starting with, uh, and we're also uh, going to use this uh, linearity of the partial differential equations. So we're actually, what we are going to do next is we're going to actually start with very simple velocity fields uh, or velocity potential fields, or if you will, stream function fields. They're all interchangeable. You can go from one to the other and the, the other to the, to the third um, without any problem. Um, so I'm, we're going to propose out of the blues maybe three or four of those Vs, and from them we're actually going to start making complicated shapes, aerodynamic shapes. So. Let's start with um, with the first one, which is a uniform flow. A uniform flow looks like this. So first, you really need to define your coordinate system. Uh, so that's a, they should be of um, constant vector length. That's my coordinate system, x and y. So. Um, my u is equal to u infinity, and I have no vertical velocity, v is equal to zero. Um, and then you, so that's what I'm starting with, a uniform flow, let me, let me describe it using those three functions, the phi, the psi, and the velocity field. So I started with the velocity field, v as a vector is u infinity i plus um, zero J. We're, so from now on, we're only going to deal with, or uh, with two dimensional, uh, systems. We're not going to go three dimensions. So these are the three interchangeable V, phi, and psi. Uh, so you start with the, uh, you start with the, um, with the phi or psi. Uh, and what you're going to, to end up, if I want to do the phi, d phi dx is equal to u. Uh, so that ends up, uh, you separate variables. Uh, d phi is u infinity dx. So phi would be u, phi would be u infinity x. And then there's a constant of integration, uh, which is that constant. And same thing. Um, d psi dy is equal to u infinity so that's your you found your velocity potential function you found your stream function and you already start started with your velocity excuse me your with your velocity field and that's if we're using cartesian coordinate system if i'm using an r theta polar coordinate system r theta i can just write, write the same thing we have defined phi and psi for polar systems. So the u infinity r cosine and u infinity r sine. Um, so for a uniform flow, can you can you prove that the um, circulate? Can you show that um, the circulation is zero? That it is irrotational. So here is my flow. So let's take those those two lines. And how do I get the circulation? I can get the circulation two ways. I can get the circulation to be uh, the integral of um, u dot dl, 
right? Or I can integrate the vorticity. So I compute the vorticity. So if you compute the vorticity, it's dv dx minus du dy. So dv dx is zero minus du dy is zero. So yeah, I have I have just shown that it is irrotational because the vorticity is zero. But let's use this and let's define and that's over a closed contour. And let's define that closed um, that closed contour. So I want to define, so here's a closed contour. This is the X and this is uh, dy. And my contour is going in this direction. That's the contour. I'm not talking about the velocity, that's I'm talking about the green line itself, the contour, the line. And now let's look at the velocity um, itself. So I have a u here. So let's do a closed integral. So I get u infinity times dx. So if I want to do that integral, I'm going to start with this point, go all around, integrate u dot dl, and l is also a vector, u dot dl, and come back to that same point. And that closed integral is going to give me the circulation. I, I don't remember if there's a minus sign, just check the um, uh, in the definition. It's not of a big deal. Um, okay, so the red line indicates my velocity, so it's u infinity. So here I have u infinity times dx. And then times dx. And then what is my vertical velocity v? It is zero. So plus zero times dy. And here, um, because I'm because the direction of the line, the contour is counterclockwise, my velocity u is u infinity is in this direction. I'm doing a dot product, right? That's my u infinity. And my dx is in this direction. So I get a cosine theta when I do this, my dx being dl. So actually dl is equal to dx. Um, and it's pointing in the negative i direction, in the negative x direction. So I get minus u infinity uh, dx because I get a cosine 180 minus u infinity, so that's a minus u infinity times dx, and then um, minus dy times v, minus dy times v, which is zero. And what should that be equal to? That is zero, identically. That's zero times dy. I get u infinity times dx minus u infinity times dx, so I would also get to zero. So that's just to show you what the that the circulation is also zero just by looking at the velocity field um, without without even going to the dv dx minus du dy. Now the second. So we have now um, introduced our first function phi is u infinity x plus a constant, which is uh, which conserves mass, it's mass conservative, because it doesn't make mass, it doesn't destroy mass, it doesn't destroy mass. Because if you do del square phi is equal to zero, uh, you're, then yes, it will hold true that del square phi is equal to zero. Uh, and I remember we said that this was um, mass conservative, uh, so this was mass conservative del square phi is equal to zero and irrotational del square psi is equal to zero. All right, so this is our first elementary system. Now, if I find another elementary system, uh, then we can start summing things up to get a third. Uh, so that's the first solution is uniform flow. It, it satisfies the potential, um, it's a potential flow. This, then the second system uh, or solution to the potential flow, which we call elementary solution, 
uh, is the sourcing term. So we've seen this before, y equals cr, if you remember. Um, so here I'm going to work with the radial coordinate system. Um, my source uh, um, means that uh, I have an infinite and a, a point from which mass flow rate ejects in all directions. Um, and let's see the properties. So that's a source. And I could also have a sink by uh, reversing the, the arrows. So mass is coming from all directions into the hole. And we, we sort of explained this. You can have this in reality by having a garden hose that ejects a fluid, let's say water, onto a plate. And you'll see, if you're just looking at the surface of the plate, you'll have this point where the water hits, and then from that point, um, you get the flow to be radially outwards everywhere. So I'm, I'm only sh showing here two vectors, which is, I'm showing that line. So I'll, I'm showing that the vector is going, I have one vector going down and one vector going up. So, uh, but in radial, in radial um, coordinate system, my radial velocity VR is C over R. So what is the velocity of the flow as it ejects from the source? At R equals zero. So my velocity is infinite. I start with, with an um, infinite velocity um, start at the at the at uh, the origin and this system has zero tangential velocity v theta is zero so it's purely radial the flow goes purely radial and what is the velocity at infinity my velocity uh, starts with with an infinite at the source my velocity the flow velocity is infinite and then it drops fast one over r um, until it gets to identically equal to zero at infinity so here is if I draw R versus VR, uh, it just looks like the one over R curve. So it's, it's infinity at zero and zero at infinity. That's the velocity VR. And we can compute mass flow rate by um, doing m the mass flow rate is, here, let's just write it, M dot is the density times the velocity perpendicular to the area. Velocity times the area. And the velocity and the area are perpendicular to each other. So if my velocity is purely radial, um, then I'm going to take this area, which is perpendicular to all the velocity vectors. It's a circle. Uh, so that's why we have um, 2 pi r. Um, that gives me the length of this contour and the depth into the page is L. That gives me an area, so that's my area. Perpendicular to the velocity VR, which is here. And then you multiply by the density. So let's take the density to the other side. I get 2 pi R L times the radial velocity. And if I just, you know, I don't really need this width into the page, so let's just plug it here. So my M dot over um, rho L is just 2 pi R V R and I'm going to call this gamma which is this the amount of mass flow rate per unit density uh, or the volumetric flow rate per unit length remember we've seen this these units in the circulation term if you remember um, uh, where did we see them we've seen them in the velocity potential remember um, mass flow rate or volumetric flow rate per unit width uh, so this would be the strength, what we call the strength of my sink or source. It's just how much mass or volumetric flow rate it's, it's giving me. Um, so that's my VR and V theta. And we've, we've to, to separate sink A from sink B, each one can have its own strength. I can have I can sum up mul multiple sources and sinks together, and now you want to start um, thinking, um, of, you know, in a graphical in a graphical fashion. 
so we will come to the graphical uh, solutions in a, in a second. So now I can find, I gave you my, the VR and V theta, and now I ask you to find the phi and the psi. So the d phi dr is VR, so I can get phi to be the logarithm of R, and the psi would be just, um, will be perpendicular. And we actually see it in those, um, in those lines. So uh, psi um, is, is, uh, is a function of, of theta. So for a constant theta, then, so that's a constant theta, I get my streamline. And for a constant r, I get uh, the circle, my phi, my, my velocity potential to be equal to a constant. Um, okay, we can, so uh, maybe the one last thing to say is that this lambda uh, is positive for a source and negative for a sink. So that's lambda negative and that's lambda is positive and you can check the circulation in fact let's check this circular path which encloses this um which encloses the uh, the source term uh, you know the velocity along the this path is purely radial just like the case we had before so we expect that the because v dot you know, we wrote this here, the u dot dl for a closed loop, uh, the velocity is radial while the dl is tangential. Uh, so they're always perpendicular to each other. So if I start with this point and integrate over this loop, I'm going to always be integrating zeros. So my circulation is zero. So it is an irrotational flow. It does not have any rotation or any circulation in it. So now, Let's sum those up. We have a uniform flow and a sink. Uh, let's start with the source. So um, here is a source and here is a uniform flow. And let's sum this up with this guy, which means at some point, because they're opposite to each other, at some point, uh, because VR varies radially, at some point I'm going to get a zero velocity here, stagnation point. And I'm going to, uh, then if I, if I draw those streamlines, I'm going to get something like this. So we're really just adding lines together. This, you see this guy is right here is going to point this way, and this guy is pointing this way. So my velocity is actually going to be the summation of those two. That's what we mean by summation. And that's what we're getting right over here. Uh, this vector. So if I sum those lines together, I'm going to get what's um, a semi-infinite Rankine body, which is this surface. You see there are, so that is, um, you know, okay, let's, let's just do the math before uh, before we move on. Uh, but let's just look at the graphical solution and I, I would like you to um, to think about this graphical solution. So here I have my u infinity, here I have my v radial. So when I sum those up, my net flow is going to be in this direction, which is along which is along the um, blue line that we have drawn here. Which is a which is also a streamline. So all these lines are streamlines, but this particular line is very interesting because at one point in the line, which is this particular point, the velocity is zero because it comes from purely horizontal velocity that comes from the source and a purely horizontal opposite velocity that comes from the uniform flow, and I get a stagnation point. So Let's stop at this point, so as not to make the lecture too long, and um, take it from here in the next lecture and go over the math. Thank you for your attention.